Right now, it's possible to use genetic engineering to extend our lifespans, cure most cancers, rejuvenate muscles and organs, and even enhance our minds. But many of these applications in humans are happening behind closed doors, in private clinics and biolabs, unknown to the general public. This practice is controversial, and in order to understand why, we need to know more about the human version of genetic engineering, gene therapy. Imagine if we could stop the process of aging completely or even reverse it. Imagine being able to target specific cells in the body like cancer or damaged tissue and remove them without affecting anything else. If you can, imagine going even further. Could we give ourselves new abilities? Could we see new colors, regrow organs, become radiation resistant or grow entirely new senses? Maybe even change our bodies so dramatically that we could survive on other planets. Yes, we could. All of these things are possible and many of them will happen within our lifetimes. The possibilities that gene therapy unlocks for the human body are so incredible that within the next decade, our entire model of healthcare will change completely and eventually our definition of what it means to be human. In this episode, we're gonna see what it means exactly to use a gene mod to change your own body and what we can currently change and which diseases we can cure. Until now, the only medicines humans have had were plants and prayers. For all of human history, and even now, most of the medicines that we take are derived directly from chemicals discovered in plants, animals, and fungi. The reason they're so effective is because these organisms contain all sorts of molecules that change the chemistry of our bodies when we eat, inject, or rub them on our skin. This whole class of traditional medicines is called small molecule therapeutics, or SMTs for short. Now, there are only so many SMTs possible, and it's getting more and more expensive to develop each new one. Discovering a new SMT these days usually requires giant factories and industrial labs. The rate of discovery for new SMTs is slowing down each year, and each new one is more expensive to develop and less effective. The well of possibilities is running dry. Why are they becoming less effective? Well, think about it. When you take a medicine, an SMT, those chemicals make lots of different changes in your body, not just to the part of you that's sick. We hope that it can fix the illness before it messes up too many other systems in your body, known as an overdose. This is always going to be a problem for SMTs, because they can never specifically target anything, there's always the risk that they're going to mess up other delicate chemical systems in your body. But gene therapy is different. Instead of just using a bunch of random chemicals, we can utilize a much more natural and precise system of disease management, one that your body already uses to heal itself and fight disease. Let's clarify the difference between genetic engineering and gene therapy. A gene therapy is just a kind of genetic engineering that lets us add new DNA to a living animal. We're talking about adding a new trait to someone like you or me. Even though all life shares DNA, the way to insert new DNA into each kind of life form is different. Bacteria, mushrooms, plants, animals, and people each require slightly different strategies to get that DNA where it needs to be, and we'll make a video about each of them eventually. But for this episode, we're going to talk exclusively about gene therapy in humans. We can broadly sort gene therapies into three basic categories, medicine, longevity, and augmentation. There's plenty of overlap, but let's look at each of these categories on their own. Medicinal gene mods can help fight disease or fix a genetic disorder. For example, people with a certain kind of degeneration in their eyes can be saved from blindness by adding a copy of the missing gene back into their eye cells. Other therapies can fix sickle cell anemia, cure type 2 diabetes, or target and eliminate most kinds of cancers. Many more diseases can be fixed with gene therapy than are currently approved. Other genetic medicines include something called a DNA vaccine, which is essentially a plasmid that can tell your body to make specific antibodies against anything, from malaria to cancer to snake bites. And even though these therapies are very cheap to produce, very, very few of them are currently available. And the ones that are can sell for millions of dollars even though they only cost a fraction of that to produce. 
Longevity gene mods are any kind of gene therapy that increases the general health or lifespan of the individual. While there is plenty of overlap with medicines, these tend to be things that our bodies do well when we're young and degrade as we get older. This would be things like removing damaged cells, repairing tissues, or modifying your body to produce medicinal proteins, hormones, or enzymes. Many of these therapies have only come to light in the last few years, as we learn more about how to measure and quantify aging. One such modification is clothoprotein, which seems to increase the average lifespan by about 25% and helps us keep our brains and muscles healthy into old age. I'm actually modified with this therapy, and we'll go more into detail with that in our next episode. Our final category, of course, is augmentation. This includes gene mods that wouldn't normally be found in humans and can usually confer new tricks and abilities that people would never have. This could be things like extra strength, radiation resistant, cancer resistance, bioluminescence, automatic tissue repair, neural regeneration, or regrowing limbs and organs. Because of the stigma around genetic modifications, this category isn't as developed as the others, but expect to see a lot more of these from underground biohackers in the next decade or two. Within the next 30 years, people are gonna be so modified and genetically diverse that we're gonna to need to develop stronger ideas of identity, humanity, and bodily autonomy. There are a few different ways to deliver a gene therapy. For a lot of gene mods, we don't need to get the DNA into every cell of the body. Like in the last video, I made melanin appear in my skin. And in order for that to work, the mod only needed to be in those skin cells. My other modification, clotho, works by modifying a small amount of muscle cells to produce the clotho protein. This protein then gets taken up by the bloodstream and distributed throughout my body. Maybe you just need to fix your liver, your skin, or your muscles. Then the effectiveness only matters in how much DNA you can get into those cells specifically. This is important to understand because the effectiveness of a gene therapy can be measured by something called the transfection efficiency. That is, for every milligram of DNA that you put into you, what percentage of it makes it into the right cells? This is a good way to compare the effectiveness of the different methods to deliver a gene therapy. The way that you deliver DNA into your body is called a vector. There are four main categories of vector. Viral, chemical, electrical, and the most modern way, nanoparticles. A viral vector is the most well-known and what most people think of when they hear gene therapies. Viruses normally work by injecting their own DNA into cells, so we can hijack that mechanism by taking a harmless virus, removing most of its DNA payload, and replacing it with the plasmid that we want for our gene therapy. Then the virus goes into your body and delivers the gene therapy to whatever cell it touches. Viral vectors have the advantage of a pretty high transfection efficiency, but it also has plenty of problems. They're complicated to make, because in order to make this viral vector, you have to grow it in mammalian cells in a petri dish, and then purify it. This is fairly difficult, and it takes a long time to do. And after all that hassle, if the therapy doesn't work, you have to go and start over from scratch. Another problem comes from the fact that we're using a virus. Even though we can use a very harmless form of virus, it can still trigger your immune system. And because of that, it's hard to ever use the same one on someone a second time because they build up an immunity to it the same way that we would for any other virus. So we needed ways around this. The next method is to use a special chemical that allows DNA to stick to the surface of cells. Most biohackers use something called PEI. This is a molecule that looks kind of like this. PEI is kind of a sticky fat that makes the DNA stick to the surface of the cells in the body where it gets sucked up into the cell. All you have to do is mix the PEI correctly with the DNA and then inject it where you want it to go. Although this is pretty easy and fast to do, the downsides are is that it has a low transfection efficiency, meaning it doesn't always work that well. Additionally, even though it's not a virus, it's still a strange chemical that your body doesn't like very much, and that can be irritating to your body. You can see some discoloration in my skin where I did one of my earlier mods with PEI. Electroporation is the idea that when cells are zapped with electricity, they open up small holes in their surface where they suck up any DNA that happens to be around them. It's weird, but it works. If you do it just right, it works pretty well, but it basically means that you have to tase yourself with needles. Not fun. Actually, this is what I did in my last video, where you saw me put that machine against my skin. 
First, I injected some DNA under my skin, and then I used this modified skincare electroborator. It worked kind of like a tattoo gun, rapidly oscillating needles back and forth into my body while simultaneously giving me small electric shocks. A friend of mine actually modified this machine from an off-the-shelf version, and I volunteered to try it out. It works all right for the surface of the skin, but if I wanted to do anything else, it means that you'd have to stick the needles really deep into your tissues and zap it even harder. It hurts really bad. And if you did it wrong, you could just end up frying your cells. This is pretty cool, but really not the best solution. Now we get to the final category of methods, and in my opinion, the most useful, nanoparticles. Nanoparticles in some form have been around for a while, but recent advancements have made them much more effective. The idea is that you can wrap DNA in a tiny soap bubble called a lipid nanoparticle, or LNP, and then inject them into your body. Whenever the LNPs touch a cell in your body, the cell eats it, and it dumps its DNA payload directly into the cell. These are a lot easier to make than viral vectors, and a lot more effective than PEI or electroporation. But for a long time, there were still problems. It could be hard to convince cells to eat the LNP. And more importantly, the oils that we used to make them were irritating to the cells and would stress them out. So it was limited how much you could use at a time. However, technology has improved dramatically in 2022. A new kind of LNP seems to have solved these problems by including a special protein into the surface of that soap bubble. The protein makes the LNP into something new, a PLV, a proto-lipiomic vehicle. Instead of just getting eaten by the cells, PLVs fuse directly with the membranes of that cell, meaning that none of those oils end up inside the cell and irritate it. So it doesn't seem to cause any problems in the body at all. Although this is new technology, they do seem incredibly safe and don't irritate anything, allowing huge doses of DNA, enough to hit almost every tissue and organ in the body. PLVs are super effective at transfection of any cell type, and when we inject them into the vein, the DNA goes all around the body evenly, allowing it to target cancers or even specific organs. This is exciting new technology, and hopefully we can have a whole episode about it, because in my opinion, it solves a lot of the problems with gene therapy, and I think it might hold the key to unlocking incredible genetic changes in every parts of our bodies. There are a lot of misunderstandings about the dangers of gene therapy. It's a powerful medicine, but like any medicine, it's important to understand the potential dangers. The first thing that most people can think of is, does this give you cancer? Cancer is caused by many things, and those things are called mutagens, like sunlight or tobacco smoke. A mutagen hurts you by randomly damaging or mutating your DNA. This is changing the code like a glitch. In order for a cell to turn into cancer, it has to have a combination of several specific mutations all at once in the same cell, something that becomes more and more likely the longer you're exposed to the mutagen. But gene therapies usually don't do this. Plasmids, those circles of DNA that we programmed, don't damage or change your DNA that you already have. And we know the plasmid itself doesn't have these mutations because we synthesized it from scratch. It's important to realize that most gene therapies don't even affect that DNA in your body. Usually the plasmid just kind of floats inside the cell and never integrates into your native DNA. Now, it is possible to have a plasmid that can integrate into your DNA, and there are some specific weird gene mods that do this. And maybe those could increase your risk of cancer but you'd have to design the therapy to do that specifically, and it's always clear which gene mods have this risk. There's usually no need to do something with that kind of danger. Most of the time, the main thing you have to worry about with gene therapies is having an immune reaction. The same thing that happens when you're allergic to something like pollen or cat hair. Allergies happen when your body senses something foreign inside of you and identifies it as an invader. This is useful for disease-causing bacteria, but sometimes your immune system can make a mistake like when you have peanut allergies. There's a similar risk with some gene mods that the body might misinterpret the effects as an invader. This could activate the immune system. Sometimes this just means a little bit of redness or inflammation and the gene therapy just ends up not working. But if you really, really mess it up with your gene design, it could lead to something more serious where you actually have an ongoing immune reaction to your own body's cells. This is a really bad outcome. Usually we avoid this problem by only using genes that are already from the human body. For example, in the last video, I made my skin express melanin, 
something my body already makes a ton of in my hair and skin, and I made sure my gene mod melanin was indistinguishable from that so it wouldn't cause any problems. Actually, most gene mods are just making more of something that you already have, sometimes in a different part of the body, but that doesn't matter so much. There's nothing foreign for the body to freak out about. Now, if you want cat ears or bioluminescent skin, there's a lot more you have to figure out to get your immune system to tolerate it, but it is solvable. These are all similar dangers that any medicine has. When a medicine is so powerful, you have to be careful to use it responsibly. If you start taking untested gene therapies, you're gonna have a bad time. But also, if you start eating random plants, you're gonna have an equally bad time. Gene therapy has a big advantage over that in that we know exactly which proteins a plasmid is going to make. There's no surprises there. We already know the DNA that's in the plasmid because we made them. And if it's something new, we can study it to see if the proteins it makes are gonna cause an immune problem. And this is why research is so important before we do crazy augmentation and why it's important to take these dangers seriously. Well, that's it. I know that was a lot of information, but I hope it's been interesting and I'm really excited that we've gotten to go over all of this groundwork so we can start discussing the real stuff, actual gene therapies. Next episode, we're gonna go to one of my favorite gene mods, Clotho. This is the one that I'm actually modified with. It's meant to significantly increase her lifespan and cognitive ability. So I'll see you next time on Gene Hub.